How's it going guys? Angus here from Makey's Muse. I've been working on some really complicated 3D models lately and I thought it would be interesting to share some of the really, I would say, advanced modeling techniques I've been employing to make these models 3D printable. Um, I've done heaps of videos in the past talking about different tweaks, tricks, um, hacks, hate that word, for <laughs> making your models 3D printable and work properly. But these are just a few advanced ones that might only be useful for some very specific use cases, but I think they're worth sharing nonetheless. Um, and just before I proceed, this is a model I'm so keen to show you guys. Um, I've already shared a uh, video on my Patreon of showing this actually printed and this mechanism working. It's an expanding mechanism that actually creates a lockbox, a uh, puzzle box, and um, it's taken a long time to get to this point. The whole thing's designed to be 3D printable. It has clearances, it, the whole thing snaps together, locks into place, no fasteners, um, and it all moves. So, yeah, pretty cool. Let's start with how I add clearances. So I've talked about this before, but what I do is I add them right at the end of the modeling process, and I add only enough that I need for the process I'm going to employ. So this is designed to be used with FDM, and I have a clearance tolerance gauge that I've, I've shown on the channel before that helps you sort of figure out what clearances your machine's kind of capable of and what you should shoot for in your designs. So I generally do a 0.3 millimeter clearance for FDM, uh, unless parts need to be quite tight, in which case there might be 0.1 or even zero if I'm going to allow myself to really use like a friction fit to lock parts together. But usually 0.3 is a good gap for things to move freely after printing, allowing for the tolerances of the 3D printing process. Again, particularly uh, the filament based FDM slash FFF. But again, resin also has its own uh, rules and clearances and tolerances to take into account as well. So how I do it in Fusion is I use this uh, press pull command. So for this part here, I've added the clearances basically right at the end. So you can see the parts are quite wide and where they fit into the body, which is this out of frame here. So you can see if I highlight them here, all these faces have been given a 0.3 millimeter clearance. Um, and the benefit of doing that is you can go in really easily. Uh, this is a bit tedious to select all the faces, yes, but it's easy to go in once you've done that and change it. So if you design it and then you find the clearances are too loose, you might want to go down to maybe 0 0.0 to 0.2, like that. Or maybe they're too tight, so you might want to like go 0.5, like that. Um, and I, I do this because it's really easy to change clearances. Now you can have a lookup table um, that works as well. And you can have a, a global clearance that you just enter that number in and then you can go back to that lookup table and change it. I don't generally do that because for multi-part models, some parts I might want different clearances to others and I'll just do it in that um, component in my, my model. So that's how I'll add clearances. However, sometimes just adding clearances isn't enough to make parts easily slide and assemble together. In which case, you might actually want to put a taper on parts that slide together. So they start off with a smaller entry, and then it's the part slowly tapers out, and they sort of wedge together or become tighter assembled, but they go together easily. In which case, you want a taper, or in, uh, in Fusion, you can use a draft angle. So draft angle is actually generally used for molding, so like injection molding. You want a slight angle to the parts to release from a mold. Uh, otherwise, if you have just straight perpendicular walls, the parts are permanently stuck in that mold when they they um, they cool and you won't get them out. So for example, in this model, this assembly has to go into the the actual box body like this and just having clearances might make it a bit tricky to line up. So I'm using a draft angle. You can see these walls are actually slightly tapered to make it easier to align the parts and then slide them together and key them in place. So again, in Fusion, we have the draft tool and you select the direction of the draft. So here it's called the pull direction and that's I've selected one of these top faces here. And then you can select which direction the draft's in. So if it drafts outwards or inwards, depending on what you're going for, and you can change your angle. So I've only got a two degree draft and that it's actually surprising how much of a difference such a small amount of uh, such a small degree makes. But if I just hold down control to show you the original and then uh, the actual uh, result, you can see it's actually, once it gets to the bottom there, the part becomes quite a fair bit smaller um, and that should help parts slide together. And you can change obviously your angle. So if you find it's too aggressive, you can just do one or you can try a larger number, like maybe, maybe three um, or even let's try five. 
uh, and it gets quite uh, severe indeed. So that might be a bit too extreme, but this is a really handy tool if you want to get parts to slide together. Now, an interesting note is with uh, 3D printing, it's a layer by layer process. So obviously when you print this, there'll be layers. And sometimes this sort of stair stepping you get with layers can make the parts um, difficult to slide together. It's not going to be a smooth edge. And that can sometimes come into play depending on how much draft angle you want and how effective that resulting ramp, I suppose, would be. But when you're only doing small amounts, like here, two degrees or so, it really actually does help parts seat together and key without, um, without really too much of an extra step. It doesn't take too much effort to add that in. All right, my next tip is for parts that snap together, for example, using a dovetail, and that is to chamfer or round out the inside sharp edges of that dovetail that snaps together, because I've found with 3D printing, those sharp edges can sort of inflate a little bit in size because of the extrusion process, which ruins your clearances and makes the parts really hard to fit together. So the reason you might want to do this is because with 3D printing with an extrusion based machine, you've got like a 0.4 millimeter nozzle, which means the minimum uh, line width is 0.4. So this means it can't just do a sharp hard corner, it will round a little bit. And when it comes to the uh, extra material get on the internal corner here, and then the edge of this corner, it actually can add up to enough to really cause an interference, even with clearances, and throw everything off. So people often add too much clearance, so it means that it clears the corners, but everywhere else is too floppy, too loose. So my fix is just to take a chamfer and then take those edges off, so that area is a non-issue. Non because it's not really, it's not necessary for the structural, the strength of that dovetail joint. Uh, you just want these faces here and this face here to mate and then lock together. And here I have another example. This is my parrot puzzle test with the levers. Uh, it's the older three lever one. Uh, so I have these legs that snap into place onto these little pegs. I'll talk about uh, why they're here in a second. But again, I've given these pegs little chamfers so that it's just the mating faces, not the corners that causes uh, binding up issues. Because you'll get the most strength from mating to the faces versus having a, like a plug bind up in the corners, but then the faces aren't touching. So again, 3D printing isn't an exact science, but I find taking the sharp edges off your dovetails or locking joints makes them much more reliable and repeatable when it comes to joining 3D printed parts together. And while we're here, let me just talk about why this pegs here in the first place. Um, and this isn't really about 3D printing, this is just about good industrial design and good engineering actually. So this leg is held in place with a screw. And what I was finding is just using a fastener, think of that fastener as a hinge. Um, it's just a bolt and the part will want to rotate around that bolt. So if you just have that and you have a variable clearance, remember because 3D printing and I was using laser cutting, you don't exactly know how wide the part's gonna end up. Um, they're either too tight, which means you can't assemble it, or there'd be a gap. And it was wanting to rotate around that bolt, which meant the legs would weren't structural, they weren't very stable. So having a peg here for the part to slide over and then you put a bolt through, it gives it far improved um, mechanical uh, stability and strength because it's locking into that peg and therefore once the bolt's in place, it can't rotate. Now you might not even need the bolt if you get clever with how these parts join together. Maybe you have a little snapping indentation or something where the parts are slide in and then friction fit and snap into place with like a catch or clasp then you don't even need a bolt. But yeah, this is something that often gets missed. People just are so quick to throw fasteners into their designs, but if you're 3D printing something or using some sort of uh, advanced manufacturing process, you have the ability to add uh, like keying features and features that lock parts together so you don't even need nearly as many fasteners or you might not even need any at all. And with that in mind, that takes us to something that even I still find challenging after modeling for years and years. Um, and that is modeling features that rotationally lock into place. It's really easy to model things that slide into place because you can just do it with a 2D sketch. But when things rotate around, how do you model that? How do you model the entry point and the locking point? It's pretty difficult. Um, so I have a few tips if you want to do such a thing because this whole top plate here actually locks onto these little uh, indentations here. Uh, and I've got a whole detail on how I did that. So I'll just uh, activate that component and hide everything else. So I can show you 
what it does. <laughs> All right. So the pegs on the other component lock into these holes and then it rotates around and then locks into these uh, little V slots. So how did I design the entry point and the rotation point? Well, you can kind of cheat using a sketch and a rotational pattern. And this is what I mean. What I did is I did a projection of that peg that intersects with this body and the projection is the purple line. And then I got that projection and I rotated it using a rotational pattern here to an amount that I thought looks good for my lock. Uh, so I did minus 12 degrees, but you could have, I could have done more like yeah, minus 15, for example. Ooh, that's too much. Like minus 15. I could have done more or less depending on how far I wanted to insert and then rotate that part. And it's important to keep in mind, and this will depend on your design intent, but I've modeled the parts in a assembled locked state. So what I need to keep in mind is I'm actually modeling where the part will enter and then rotate into place. It's a bit of a, it's a bit confusing. But this one here is where I wanted to enter and then rotate into place. So keep that in mind. You might want to make sure it rotates clockwise or counterclockwise and it will that will affect where you do your pattern and uh, which direction you go. But in this case, it creates this nice cutout where the part will enter here and then rotate into my assembled state where it locks into place. Now in regards to modeling in the locking V slot, um, I've just dropped in a nice little cross-sectional analysis to show you how this was drawn. So I did the original slot cut out on the other body and then I did a project of that sketch onto this component. So it's, it's directly copied identically. And then once I got that sketch of the V slot, I just extended it out to make sure it intersected with the, the body because I want to do a rotation that adds material to this component. And with this rotation, I just de determined the extent using angles. So this is just going up from both sides five degrees, but you could of course, you could change that, you know, six, seven, whatever. But keep in mind, I need the parts to insert and go in uh, at this point and then go into the slot. So I chose five because it doesn't need to be too long. Like there's only a small amount of engagement there uh, like that, which gives us plenty of room to insert the part and then rotate it into that slot. And then I did a few chamfers to make it easier for the part to slide in. So I did a larger chamfer like this. Um, and I also did it to this edge just to cut that sharp edge off, just to make it a little bit easier to insert and a little bit aesthetic as well. I cut this edge off too, but really this one's more important. So this is to allow it to ease into that V slot. And then, like I mentioned before, I did another small chamfer to knock that sharp edge off to make sure that it has clearance on the inside of that V slot to just push it into place. And when it came time to add clearances to this slot, I only added clearances to the outside and not the V slot. Um, so you can see here, I added clearances to allow the, the peg to go in but that V slot is going to be interference. It's going to be really tight and I don't want it to ever come loose. So maybe I will have to add clearance to that part in future, but I do want a really tight interference fit. So I'll see how we go and I can always come back to this point and change it. Finally, once you do all of that work, if you want it in multiple places, then the pattern tool is your best friend. Obviously I want this to lock into every peg on the peripheral aspect, periphery of, of this design. So I did a rotational pattern circular pattern and then it went round like this. Also just another quick bonus tip. If you're doing a rotational pattern and you want it to only pattern in certain areas, you can just untick boxes. So for example, this is where the key is used. I don't want it to be in that area, um, but I want it to be in these. So I just untick that and then say, okay. And there you go very quickly, some really complicated geometry um, with very little effort. But yeah, guys, I think I'm gonna leave it there. This design has so many other things that I've already talked about on this channel, other tips and tricks, like how to add your logo or graphics as an SVG to your 3D model. Also how to mitigate the need for support material by designing things with bridges. For example, this sh straight edge here is intentionally designed to not require support material in that area. Uh, and then there's also tips like making parts print without the dreaded elephant's foot effect and how to mitigate that. All of those videos are linked in the video description and I'm really looking forward to bringing this, uh, this video out with this mechanism for you guys because it's really, really fascinating. It's very mesmerizing to watch as well. I found it in my 
ancient book of mechanisms. It's like a centuries old expanding pulley mechanism. And I've adapted it into this puzzle box. Really cool, can't wait to bring it to you guys. So if that's interesting to you, then maybe consider subscribing. But either way, I look forward to seeing you again very shortly here on Maker's Muse. Catch you later guys, bye.